welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your weekly home for all things related to helping you on your journey to finding that amazing job. Each episode, I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, entrepreneurs, coaches and bloggers who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had a decade ago when I graduated. And a big hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast for episode 64. 64 episodes focused specifically on helping you find a graduate job. We've got episodes on specific companies, on interview skills, assessment centres, overcoming fear when applying for jobs, how to find your dream job, you name it, we've got an episode on it. If you're new to the show, head over to the website at graduatejobpodcast.com where you can find a list of all of the episodes and lots more in between. And I have a very special episode today. It's a veritable treat from one of my very favourite authors. It's different maybe from previous episodes as today we explore how to get a job working for yourself. Yes, we look at entrepreneurship with the brilliant MJ DeMarco, self-made millionaire and best-selling author of the Millionaire Fastlane and his latest book, Unscripted. It's a cracking episode where we explore, amongst other things, why you shouldn't do what you love, why getting a job and working for somebody else is inherently risky and why trading time for money is a bad trade-off. We also explore the secrets to starting your own business, how simple mathematics holds a key to being able to get rich quickly, and what might be holding you back from being an entrepreneur. Now, if you have ever thought about starting your own business, then this episode and MJ's message is one you aren't going to want to miss. As always, there will be a full transcript to the episode and links to everything we discuss in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash fastlane. So make sure you're heading over there and definitely check them out. Before we start though today, let's have a little message from today's sponsor who are CareerGym.com. CareerGym is a number one place for you to undertake all of your psychometric tests, which you're going to face when you apply for a graduate job. You can practice verbal, numerical and abstract reasoning tests, all produced by experts and exactly the same as the ones you're going to see in the real tests. You can just practice them or you can do them in exam mode under time pressure and they all come with detailed explanations and solutions and you can track your progress and see how you compare against your peers. Now, it's never too early to start revising for numerical tests as you might not get much notice before the test itself, so make sure you're going to be ready to go. Pull your finger out and start revising today. I've been recommending the site for years to the clients I coach and it comes very highly recommended. And what's even better is if you use the code GJP, you're going to get 20% off all of the tests. You can't say fairer than that. So head on over to careergym.com and use the code GJP to get 20% off and start practicing today. Now on with the show. I'm very excited to have today's guest on the show. For over Three years ago now, I had a list of the people I wanted to interview, and this gentleman's name was right at the top of that list. He is an entrepreneur. He's the founder of the Fastlane Forum and former CEO of limos.com, and he's also best-selling author of the brilliant Millionaire Fastlane and his new book, Unscripted, which in my opinion is even better. Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, MJ DeMarco. Hey, James. Uh, Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, pleasure, MJ, pleasure. It's good to have you on your show. And today we're going to talk about graduate entrepreneurship. But before we do, why don't you start by going into your background? Because I know it's been a winding road for you to get where you are today. And unlike many authors on entrepreneurship, you've actually walked the walk. Sure, sure. I, um, I've been an entrepreneur uh, my entire life. Um, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur early on. Uh Probably since I was, uh, I would say it was 14 or 15 years old. Uh, that all started when I, I met uh, um, an entrepreneur who was driving a Lamborghini, uh, Countach, and he was a young man. And uh, when I asked him, uh, you know, got the courage to go up to him and ask him. You know, mind you, I was 14, 15 years old, so I was kind of shy. Uh, and he said he was an inventor. So that kind of put me on the path as, you know, hey, entrepreneurship uh, is a path to, 
you know, living a great life. Uh, so I never lost that identity, um, you know, throughout college and throughout high school and whatnot, because it's it's kind of hard to maintain that identity when you're going through school, because school trains you to essentially, you know, get a job, uh, graduate, and then, you know, work for some corporation. So I started uh, many, many companies uh, in my early years, um, failed a whole lot of things. Uh, my, my first successful company was uh, based on the job that I used to have, which was driving uh, limousines, or I think they're called people carriers um, in the UK. And that's what kind of drove me to uh, discovering a need in that particular industry. Uh, I started that internet company uh, with less than $1,000 uh, without any formal training uh, in that particular, uh, you know, the internet didn't have, didn't have computer science skills or, or training in that respect. I, I, won't, I ran that company for about 10 years, um, sold it actually twice, once in the, the dot-com craziness, uh, and that didn't last very long. That company ended up going bankrupt. I ended up buying it back, owned it for another six or seven years, and then sold it again. Uh, after that, I started a publishing company uh, to promote my books and other ventures in writing, which is basically my passion. Um, I wanted to start writing nonfiction, which was based on entrepreneurship, and I also have a uh, interest in fiction as well. Uh, and then I also started the Fastlane Forum, which is a uh, one of the most widely visited forums for entrepreneurship uh, discussions. And I've owned that for, actually now it's been, that's been going on 10 years as well. And uh, I became a multimillionaire early, early in my 30s. Um, I consider myself semi-retired, uh, which I did about at 37 years old. And by semi-retired, that just means I get to pursue ventures um, that I don't have to worry about money. Um, it, a lot of people will notice that my books are kind of tears. Uh, they're kind of outside the mainstream. And the fact I can do that because I'm not worried about money. I'm not worrying, okay, is this going to, you know, is this going to sell? So I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. So that's the kind of freedom, uh, you know, you can have when you, get rid of this equation that money has to be involved and today i am on your podcast ah super and i know when um i was badgering you to to come on the show you were initially reticent that your message might sort of go against the grain of some of my previous episodes of you know how to get a job and some of the tools and tactics to go about how to get a job um but the the beauty of running my own podcast is that I can get on guests who excite me and uh, who I, I always ask myself, you know, would I want to, would I, would I have wanted this information when I was 21? And uh, mm -hmm. in your case, you know, it's definitely a yes. So starting maybe at the beginning, um, this is a graduate job podcast. Why do you think getting a nine to five job is a poor trade for people? Well, because there's, there's, a constraint on you. It's like being handcuffed. First of all, it's I've always felt that college was a training ground uh, or an indoctrination camp toward dependence. Because what it's essentially doing is training you how to go out and attract someone who is going to feed you. And that's your job. Obviously, if you don't have a job, you don't get fed and you got to go out looking for another job. Uh, and that type of existence did not appeal to me. I didn't want to learn how to attract someone that was going to feed me. I wanted to learn to feed myself. Uh, and that, in essence, is what a lot of entrepreneurship and business is about. Instead of, you know, serving the company, you serve yourself. That way you get away from this, this dependence. And another thing that uh, I found that was critically important is, you know, I wanted to live a great life. I didn't want to be bound to a nine to five or a Monday through Friday or a three week vacation every year. I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And a job just would not make that possible. And also that kind of life also requires a lot of money. So when you're in a job, you're having an employer who is going to dictate what you can make. 
So you can do a wonderful job with your employer. I mean, just really knock it out of the park. But your employer is not going to say, you know, you did such a great job. Instead of paying you 60 pounds uh, a year, we're going to pay you 250 pounds next year. It's just not, it's not in that type of, it's, a, it's an arrangement that is limited and controlling. I, in, the, in my first book, The Millionaire Fast Lane, I call it uncontrollable limited leverage. And that's what, that's what happens when you grab a job is because you cannot elevate your income into the stratosphere as opposed to the right business, you can. You can be one, one year you made 40000 the next year you made 400000 That is one of the appeals that entrepreneurship had to me as opposed to getting a job or, you know what, I need to make more money, so I'm going back to school and I'm incurring more debt in order so I can make, you know, 10 15% more. It, that, that, those kind of mathematics do not lend itself to making a lot of money and setting yourself free. Yeah, as you said, you can have a great year and, you know, you, you may be pleased with getting a 3% pay rise, um, which isn't really going to change the needle. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 in, and in fact, you know, you hear people say, oh, starting a business is risky. Well, having yourself and your income tied to a corporate overseer is just as risky because you can walk in and they can pull you into the office and say, Sorry, uh, you know, some things have changed. Uh, we're going to have to let you go. And then, and then, bam, you're, quote, out of business, just like that. Mm -hmm. no, that's a great point. And in your first book, uh, links to which are in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash fastlane, um, you use the description of people either being in the, the sidewalk, the slow lane, or the fast lane. And that analogy really stuck with me, and I realized at the time I was a 100% slow laner. Um, can you run through for the listeners what you mean by each of those descriptions? Sure. Uh, basically, they revolve around what is your perception and what is your approach toward freedom and toward uh, a financial plan or financial independence. A, a sidewalker is a classification of an individual who has no financial plan. They often live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, everything they spend goes toward consumer goods, material items. Uh, they're basically working to fund their lifestyle. They don't save. Uh, you know, if they lose their job, they're you know they end up on you know government assistance or or whatnot. And the interesting thing about the sidewalk is there's many affluent people who are on the sidewalk. I mean, they could be doctors, they could be engineers, they could be entrepreneurs. Uh, it doesn't really matter because there's no financial plan and the person, whatever they make, they spend in, into, uh, to, into their lifestyle. This is why you see a lot of professional athletes who, you know, they live spectacularly, but once they retire, you know, in a few years they go bankrupt. That's because they're living on the sidewalk where income equals lifestyle and there's no savings. The slow lane is the next categorization, and it's usually someone that does have a financial plan, except their financial plan is banked on what the mainstream tells them their financial plan should be, which is to basically save 10% of your paycheck and give it to the stock market, give it to the financial world, and then wait 50, 60 years and lit compound interest work its magic. And then once you wait 50 or 60 years, you're going to retire a multimillionaire. And it's a deferred life plan where you live poor and then you die rich, which does not make a lot of sense because when you want your freedom, you want your youth, you want, you know, you want better health. I'm not suggesting that you can't be healthy at 65 or 70, but most of life is already evaporated. And that plan, the slow lane plan, is trumpeted by the mainstream. It's part of what I call the scripted plan. It's trumpeted by the financial industries who uh, make a fortune on managing your money. Uh, you notice the hedge funders are always filthy rich and the financial firms are always filthy rich because they make a fortune 
managing your money while you sit around and wait for 50 years for it to grow into something substantial. Then the third avenue is the fast lane. And the fast lane uh, is basically unleveraged entrepreneurship, or excuse me, leveraged entrepreneurship into a business that has the potential to scale into the millions, uh, either in income or valuation. And uh, in the book, I go through all the various parameters to make that happen. Basically, like I said before, we're looking to, you know, instead of making $4,000 a month, we want to be able to expand that maybe into $40,000 a month. When I own my internet company, uh, you know, five and six figure profitable months uh, were normal. Even even today as a publishing company owner and the uh, administrator of a forum, same thing. Those, those you know, making 30, 40, $50,000 a month is very probable because I've accessed the metrics that allow that to happen through this, what I call fast lane entrepreneurship. You see, you don't have to live frugally and patiently when you make that kind of income. And you just can't make that kind of income in a job unless you're a doctor or, or an engineer with you know decades of experience or something crazy. So the fast lane is a way to circumvent all that through entrepreneurship. So you can live the life you want to live earlier when you're younger as opposed to you know waiting around until you get to retirement age. And you had mentioned yourself that you know you wish you had this book when you were 20 years old. Yep. And that's kind of how I written it. I wrote it to say, you know what, what would I have loved to have known when I was 20 years old? And that's the books I write. No, that's brilliant. And um, yeah, and that's why exactly I wanted to get you on the show just to, uh, so uh, listeners can, um, you know, uh, just get awareness to you and, uh, you know, read the books. And um, as I said, links to the books will be in the show notes. So uh, definitely check them out. They are highly recommended. And my copy is very well thumbed. Um, <laughs> and you mentioned... Um, getting rich quick there but there's people have that instinctive reaction of um being skeptical of the idea sure. of uh, you know of, of getting rich quick and of just being able that it's actually possible to um scale your your income uh, as quickly as that um and you're talking in the book about the difference between getting rich quick and getting rich easy um could we delve into that for a bit and what the two differences sure. are Sure. I mean, you met, you say that you say the phrase "get rich quick," and you're going to scare a lot of people. You're going to be labeled a scammer, yeah. uh, and all kinds of different things. But the truth is, it's it exists. I mean, people get rich quick all the time. Uh, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is the younger youngest billionaire on the planet. Well, he had to get rich quick. Uh, and there's many many of these stories that happen all the time. What happens is we confuse get rich quick with get rich easy. You can get rich quick. It's just not very easy. And the point of the fast lane is to identify the linchpins, the critical points in our business structure that improve the probability of that happening. Now, I mentioned before that if you're making an income of 40, 50, 60,000 dollars or pounds a month, how quickly will you pay off your bills, pay off your debts? How quickly will you start to acquire wealth? And that's what we're talking about. And when you're into a business that has these metrics, these unlimited metrics, these scalable metrics, that becomes possible. The friends in, all, the, the, the friends in my um, circle of friends, they all live by these metrics. And I see it in their life. And now, I wouldn't, they wouldn't say they gotten rich quick, but they live extraordinary lives. They, they make a large income. They're tr they travel a lot during the year. They have no one to answer to. You know, some days they're working 10 hours and some days they're working one hour. The point is, it's their, it's their decision to make. So don't, don't be afraid if you hear the word get rich quick, because look around, it happens all the time. The thing is, we want to set our expectations to realizing, hey, that could happen if we put our effort into the proper work modalities and the proper equations, the mathematical equations, it can happen. Because 
because wealth essentially is all about math. And we want to be able to access those equations that allow faster wealth to happen. It doesn't happen with the, mar the stock market because you're limited by the equations. And this is a very important distinction I make in both my books is how important math is if our objective is to acquire wealth quicker than the 60-year or 50-year plan. So maybe then um, listeners might be thinking, okay, what are those equations? So what what are the, the, the right and wrong equations to, uh, to uh, getting rich uh, quickly? Because... You know, they would understand the premise that sure, working nine to five isn't isn't going to do it. Okay. Well, the slow lane is premi is premi uh, excuse me premised on the wrong equations. The slow lane is you are paid for your time. So an employer says, you know what, you're worth sixty thousand dollars or sixty thousand pounds a year. And that's what I'm willing to pay you. So your metric, your your equation there is whatever the employer decides. So you're locked into an equation. And then when you, let's say you save 10% of your earnings and you put it into the stock market, well, there you're bound by another equation. And that is how much is the market going to make this month or this year? And usually a good, a good year in the stock market is, you know, 8%. So right there you're limited again by another equation the stock market although you know it's been pretty crazy lately the stock market is not going to make you 400 percent next year so you're bound by these equations when you take an avenue of uh of i guess your career and if it, if it happens to be tied to a job that doesn't have any kind of upside metrics, say commissions, or if you're a mortgage person and you you have an unlimited scale, you're bound by these equations, and the equations are limited in their scope of expansion. So the fast lane moves to entrepreneurship, which has unlimited equations. And that's important because if you say you want to open a store on the corner of Main Street, you're still binding yourself to those equations because your store on Main Street is limited to the amount of people that can come into your store and buy whatever you're selling. So we don't want those kind of mathematical equations. We want better equations. For instance, I am an author, and my book is sold all over the world. And I can call my printer up and say, hey, you know what? I need a million copies. And they can do it pretty easily. So there's no, there's no unlimited governing of the mathematical equation that I'm bound by. And all my business ventures follow that simple formula. Is there an equation? Is there an unlimited equa equation here? I can sell 10,000 books just as easily as I can sell 10 million books. So that means my income or my ability to generate wealth is also bound by that same metric. So if I sell 10 million books, well, I probably just made you know, twenty million dollars. So that's the kind of type of mathematics we got to get involved in, and that all drives in what is your product? Is it replicatable? Is it scalable? Um, you know, how is it delivered? What's the medium? Is it sold on Amazon? Is it sold on the internet? Is it sold in a store? These are all the kinds of variables I discuss in the book, in order to give you on the, the correct equations that could generate you know, quicker wealth for you and your family. That's brilliant. And it makes complete sense. Um, again, you know, removing yourself is a limiting factor, whether it's in, um, you know, time. You mentioned the example there of working in a store and you know, you've only got so much footfall through it. You can only open it so many hours a day. You can only be there so many, so many hours, um, which leads on to my next question. Um, as a career coach, one of the things that the, the people I coach often ask me is, um, you know, when they're looking for jobs, they're looking for um, a job, something that they're going to they're going to love doing or they've got they've got passion for. And often with people starting businesses, you see people starting a business because it's something that they're they love doing or they're, they're passionate about. And I know uh, I can probably feel your blood pressure rising from uh, even across the Atlantic. This is something that you um, you talk about in the book is not necessarily being the right way to go about when you're starting a business, starting a business yeah. is something that you love. Yeah, yeah, I call it the wonder twins of uh, epically bad life advice. 
Um, and it's called Do What You Love and Follow Your Passion. Um, I mentioned earlier in my story uh, that I failed a lot. Um, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I failed a lot in my early business dealings. And that's because that's what I was doing. I was following my passion. I was doing what I loved. And here's the thing. The market doesn't give a shit. The market doesn't care what you love and what your passions are. The market only cares, what are you going to do for me? How much does this cost? And when can I get it? So you have to approach the market very selfishly because there are, there's a smart, the market is selfish. So you can't be selfish yourself. And, you know, the argument that I get from there is, well, I don't want to do, you know, I, I don't want to do work that doesn't, you know, that doesn't passionate, you know, and I have no passion for that work. Well, work is generally not supposed to be passionate. Uh, I mean, even today, I end up, there's a lot of work I do that I'm not terribly passionate about. You know, I have to, I have to deal with Amazon on a daily basis. I'm not passionate about that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to be famous. So, you know, doing podcasts is not something I'm particularly passionate about. But I do it because I know it's a part of my meaning and purpose. You know, a good example that I use about debunking this idea that you should, quote, follow your passion is, uh, you know, there are millions and millions of blogs out there that are just dead. They have one or two posts on them, and then the author abandons them. Well, isn't it safe to say that all of those authors who started blogs and that they're now dead started that blog with passion? But yet now it's dead. So if following your passion was enough to create a market need, all those blogs would be active. But they're not. And the difference is, is the passion comes from the market. When it receives your offer, it receives your value and enjoys what you do. To, to further up that example, let's say you did start a blog because you're following your passion. And after the first blog post, your, your article that you've written was shared a million times. It got millions of likes, comments up the yin-yang. Well, do you think you're going to do another article? Of course you will, because you saw that the world valued your work, and that drives passion. You know, Steve Jobs said in his speech at Stanford University commencement, do what you love. Now, I know he didn't mean to do what you love physically, you know, theor or figuratively. He meant it that once the world appreciates your work, you are going to love what you do. And you, you think Jobs would be up there saying that if he was a perennial failure? No Apple, never created a Macintosh, never did anything, just failed one failure after another. Do you think he would still be saying, love what you do? Of course not. He loves what he did. He loves what he does because the market loved what he does. It appreciated his value. It appreciated what he contributed to society. So my argument is quit following your passion, quit doing what you love, and give the market what it wants. And when the market appreciates what you do, you also will love what you do. You also will feel that passion. When I get people telling me that, oh, my God, your book changed my life. Your book, I started a business, and now I'm on I'm track for $10 million in sales this year. That generates an incredible amount of passion for me. And yet when I wrote the book, there were many times I was not passionate about writing it. So there's a very important distinction here. That if we want to, uh, we want to engage the market with something that it wants and demands, not necessarily what we're passionate about. And some listeners, MJ, are going to be banging the table saying, "Yes, I get it." There are going to be others who get it but won't be ready to make the leap, and there'll be some people who probably turned off. But for those that get it, where should they start then? Where should they start with starting their own business? Well, everything starts with value. Uh, too often entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs, they approach the market with the wrong premise. And their premise is, I want to make money. 
or I want to travel the world. I want to be my own boss. Okay, those are all great things, but they're the wrong premise. The proper premise is to attack the market based on a value equation or a value or what I call a value array. If you think about anything that you have purchased recently in your life, it's because the, the, the company that you purchased from demonstrated some kind of relative value. And relative value is how you start a business. So if you look at any kind of offering, you're, you're, you make a subjective analysis based on you know, the price, the design, the labeling, uh, the features. All these things are in, going to your head and you say, you know what, the value is over here. I'm going to give this company my money. So to start a business, and it's not as complicated as, or, or, or uh, you know, complicated as people think, what you want to do is reverse engineer the value array down to its minute components. And anytime you can skew value in each of those components, you create yourself a business opportunity. Sometimes you only need to skew value in one or two attributes in order to create a business. Now, the most common value attribute is price. And I don't recommend that because then it becomes a commoditized type of situation you're lowering your margins, you're lowering your profit. There are tons, there are literally hundreds of value arrays that you could skew uh, value on. You can offer better customer service. You can offer a better website design. You can offer uh, better convenience. You can offer just so many different things. You, your pictures could be better on your website. I mean, the, the, the amount is infinitesimal because again, when we're looking at products to buy, we gauge, we do this subjective analysis in our head and we say, there's something about that other company I don't like. And it could be something as simple as there's no 800, there's no number on the website or the pictures are blurry or something. When we reverse engineer all those attributes and learn to start skewing one or two of them or even three of them, that's when we create business opportunities in virtually any industry because the world is not perfect. If you think the world is perfect, that means there's no more business opportunities out there. So as long as the world is imperfect, there's always going to be opportunity for businesses to be created to create value. I love that point. And as you mentioned in the book, it's um, when you come across something, when you think, oh, you know, that service was crap or that X was crap, you immediately just start thinking, well, actually, well, you know, how could I improve it? What could I do differently? Where can I create the value to to create a better service? And straight away, you've got a possible option then of something you can explore. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the best example of a value skew is Uber. Uh, you know, Uber has disrupted the taxi business and the, the people carrying business because they didn't skew value on one attribute. They skewed value on every attribute, you know, convenience, pricing, uh, uh, online service, um, you know, the ability to see who your drivers, all these different factors, all these value attributes were skewed to be better than the taxi industry. And that's why they're a billion dollar company because usually companies are just started with, you know, one or two attributes are skewed. Well, they skewed all of them. So that's why now they're this huge company, you know, all over the world because of the value skew. Yep. Yeah. And uh, they are very good. They are very good. So thinking then about the a listener who might just have graduated MJ, um, they're possibly looking for a job at the moment. Is entrepreneurship something it needs to be all or nothing, uh, you know, 100% uh, trying to start a business? Or would you recommend initially, you know, doing something on the side, a little side project or side hustle uh, to get started, you know, have a job with the money coming in? And then once it gets to a certain critical mass, you can, you know, move aside into the into the business full time. Well, I, I recommend whatever works for the individual. Um, some people will be better at burning the boats and just saying, you know, I'm going to start something and I'm not going to you know, get a job. Um, when I started, what was best for me was I had jobs, but they, they were, they were menial jobs, jobs I could have gotten right out of high school. 
So they didn't require a lot of mental energy. Um, but, you know, side hustles, uh, getting a normal, there's a danger in getting a normal job because it's, it's very mentally taxing. Uh, and then when you get home, you have no energy left for your business. So it's a very dangerous um, proposition to get a job that is, you know, a decent paying job. Because also then, not only is your time taken away and, you know, you have no energy when you get home, but then lifestyle entrapment ensues where you get, a, you know, a newer flat or a newer car or, you know, these expenses start to build. And then you need the job. You have no freedom to actually pursue anything else because you're trapped into it. And that's kind of how the scripted trap uh, kind of begins. Um, but again, it's different for everyone. I would want to make this important note that if you have goals to be an entrepreneur, you need to identify as an entrepreneur. Meaning you don't say, well, you know, I work at, uh, you know, I work at Lockheed Martin and I want to be an entrepreneur because that identity right there advocates for the status quo. And you'll never get out of that job because you have already identified yourself as an engineer who works at Lockheed Martin who wants to, future-oriented, be an entrepreneur. You have to identify as an entrepreneur and instead say something like, I'm an entrepreneur who temporarily works at Lockheed Martin. That way, your current situation is not reflective of the status quo which means you're going to work to get out of that situation to match your identity. You see, that's one of the things that helped me in my lifetime is I've always identified as an entrepreneur, even though I had jobs. I had, you know, a dozen different jobs before I actually struck some success, but I always identified as an entrepreneur. And that ensured that my daily activities, daily actions, would reflect an entrepreneurial mentality, and I would always be moving forward to that identity as opposed to saying, well, I'm, I'm in a job, I'm an engineer, and I would like to be that someday because that's a status quo identity which does not encourage any kind of change. So that's a very important distinction in how we identify ourselves. I mean, um, you've got two degrees mj you um you said you've always um, identified as an entrepreneur um you got yourself two degrees and then as you mentioned by your own definition you worked in you know low paying um you know, sort of menial jobs tax um, um delivering pizzas and, and that sort of thing yeah. how did you how did you keep pushing yourself forward through what must have been a uh, difficult time after you know graduating twice your friends were all um working for big companies how did you how did you keep yourself going without just you know chucking it in and you know getting a job well i just i knew i knew the equations that i was latching on to had favorable you know had favorable odds and favorable metrics so you know i also had the right expectations uh you know entrepreneurship is like baseball you just don't go up to the plate like someone on your someone in your audience right now might be saying, you know what, this this sounds good. I'm gonna I'm going to try it. Well, this is not something you try. It is something you live. So you don't you don't go up to the, the baseball plate, look at the pitcher, take three swings, strike out, and say, okay, well I'm done. That's not how you become a baseball player. You have to continually get up there. You have to continually swing. And I said, I had made multiple swings. So I had the right expectations. I knew, okay, this doesn't happen on one swing. You strike out, you, know, you hit some foul balls, and, and then eventually you hit a single. And then maybe then you hit a double or a home run. The point is you want to continually live this as an identity, as a lifestyle. Because, again, if you're just thinking to yourself, quote, I'd like to try it, you shouldn't even bother because that's like saying, well, I would like to become a baseball player, so I'm going to go up to the plate and just swing once and see what happens. Well, you'll never become a baseball player doing that. You have to continually hone the practice as a lifestyle, as an existence, and make it your career. Even though you may have a job doing something else, you have to identify as an entrepreneur. And do you think entrepreneurship's for everybody? No. No, not at all. And 
there's some people on the, on the, the call that would be like, Man, this is not for me. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But there are also some people who are into jobs. They, they've done everything they've told. They got the business degree and then they got the job and they've been doing it for two years. And they're like, seriously, this is, this is what it is. This is, this is all there is. And those are the people I'm talking to that there is another option available to you. And this is something that you'll want to look into, but no, I don't think everyone wants to be an entrepreneur because some people, um, you know, just aren't wired for it. They're not, they don't, you know, it doesn't appeal to them and that's fine. I have no problem. I mean, the world needs employees just as much as they need employers. So I'm not here to convince everyone that this is for them, but for the people that have that inkling that there, there's something else, then yes. So often you have that inkling and it, it burns away in your stomach and you, you know it's there, but you keep suppressing it. What do you think are the key reasons why people do suppress it and you know don't act on it? Well, we live in a scripted world and uh, the scripted world is all about the same thing, which is you, you go to school, you graduate, and then you get a job. And that's the whole world revolves around that modality including the media, our educational institutions, and, and our government. So when you're, when you're just encircled by this constant scripted dogma, it is so terribly hard to escape that dogma because it's constantly around you. Your friends are doing it. Your parents have done it. So it's terribly difficult to escape it. So the first defense is obviously acknowledging that you live in a scripted world that you do not want to comply to, and you're going to fight to get out of it. And once you start fighting to get out of it, you'll start attracting other people who subscribe to the same unscripted type of philosophy. Uh, you know, the people all in my life are a good mix of unscripted people and people who have jobs, but, you know, they're all particularly happy people. And that's what really life is about, is you want to surround yourself with people who, uh, you know, support your goals, but in generally are happy. They don't need to be entrepreneurs. They just want to be, they just need to be happy. What about for people then who don't support your goals and try and, you know, actively or just passively um, even try and hold you back? Well, this may not be a popular thing to say, but I, you know, get rid of them. <laughs> uh, you know, life is short. This is your life to live. Uh, you don't need you you want people who support you and if if getting a job is what you want to do and they support it that's great but if you're going to step out and go on your own and they don't support you i mean it, this is tough enough as it is you don't need people in your life who are going to be a headwind against you so if these people are not supporting you and they're not happy or they're contributing to misery there's no reason why you should not be able to say, you know what, I'm going to distance myself from this person because they're not good for my life. Uh, and that's, I mean, we do the same thing with television. Uh, you know, I stay away from politi political uh, TV here in America because it's absolutely disgustingly, uh, it's just terrible. It's, it's, it's not good. So I do not, I do not tune into it. So likewise, if I had a buddy who constantly would be talking about politics and I would tell him to shut up about it and he wouldn't comply, I would say, well, you know, I just don't want to hang out with this person anymore. So essentially, we want to turn off the TV. So our friends could be the same way or the so-called friends could be the same way. We just have to turn them off. And uh, I've just got your, a copy of your latest book in my hands, MJ, Unscripted. Uh, life liberty in the pursuit of entrepreneurship uh, page one two six listeners let me just read a couple of my favorite quotes out mj um one from you you might not be the sharpest pencil in the box but don't fret you're surrounded by pencil sharpeners the world is already yours but only if you're willing to go get it and uh, another quote from uh, that you took from the fast lane forum uh, where one of the the contributors said the internet has largely rendered college and education in general irrelevant. For those who want to learn anything, open your browser and go to get it. 
I love the idea that you you have there that you know the there's so much you can learn out there. You don't have to just stick with what you taught, learned at university, that you can go out and get the knowledge for yourself that's going to help you to create a fast lane business. Absolutely. And then just some amazing quotes you selected there. And just the other day I mentioned, I don't know who I was talking to, but I said, you know, everything, every success in my life has not come from what I learned in college. It has come from what I learned after. And we live in an amazing time where all the knowledge is out there. And it's, for the most part, it's free. If you just want to apply yourself and go get it. And it wasn't like that, you know, 50 years ago. You, you couldn't, I couldn't, you know, you couldn't do certain things 50 years ago because the knowledge wasn't there. It wasn't available. It wasn't accessible. Today, there's no excuse. It's there. You just have to go get it determine what you need to get and then go apply it. And that's why it's just amazing that more people cannot see this. And they think that just because they graduated, oh, the education has stopped. Well, I can tell you right now, if your education stops when you graduated, you're going to live a pretty mediocre and un, un extra, unordinary life. And that's, that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. You talk in the book how you moved from uh, Chicago, the cold, windy city, down to uh, Phoenix, where you are at the moment. And I'm surprised in the UK just how many people don't also take advantage of the opportunities they've got to, to move. You know, if you're not happy with the weather in the UK or the opportunities in the UK, you can, you know, you can go live in Europe. You can move to Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, all really, really easily. Um why did you personally make the change uh, from Chicago, MJ, down to Phoenix? Well, I believe to be successful, you have to be in the right environment. Uh, I, I believe I was seasonally um, depressed in Chicago with um, vitamin D disorder or whatnot because the sun would never shine. Uh, so it was very important for me to get into an environment where I would want to succeed. And uh, I craved sunshine, so Phoenix was the natural choice for me. But it's very important that, you know, again, this is you only have one life, and you're not going to get the time back. So if you have the opportunity to move somewhere that's uh, a dream location or something you've always wanted to do, by all means, go do it, because that motivates you to work even harder to, to make your dreams a reality. I mean, if I lived in a, a, a city or a town that was just miserably cold or dark and dreary, I don't think I would want to work. And so it's important to recognize what environments work for you. And once you recognize it, you need to put yourself in that environment to foster your success because that's what's you, – you need to get these variables in line that make the probabilities work for you. Uh, if you're living in some place that is killing you, you're you're skewing the probability poorly for yourself. So we're all, I always talk about probabilities in mathematics because in the end the universe is written in the in the language of mathematics, and we can hack our life when we access these mathematics. So. Speaking of uh, cold, dark, and depressing places, I think you just ticked off most of the UK there, MJ. So, uh... <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> and uh, also speaking of time, so time is running away with us. So maybe just one more question, MJ, before we move to our uh, couple of quick fire questions. Uh, one last one. What would you say to someone who who agrees with what you're saying? It really resonates with them, but they're scared. They've got that fear that's that's holding them back. How can they how can they overcome that fear? Well, they just have to do it. I mean, what 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 is the worst that can happen? Um, you know, life is all about failure. So what is the worst that can happen? Uh, you know, I have jobs. Um, you know, the, the idea that my friends were teasing me because I was delivering pizzas um, and doing jobs that I could have done, you know, when I was 16 years old. Yeah, I feared that. But my, my demand to live a life that I wanted to live was far stronger than those fears. So you either want it hard, bad enough or you don't want it bad enough. Uh, fear should not be a 
a uh, an obstacle. It should be a motivator because I fear getting up at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday for the next 50 years and doing a job that I absolutely hate. I fear that. So that fear was far greater than my fear of failure. It was far greater than my fear of having a, a menial job that didn't pay well. It was far greater than being teased by my friends. It was far greater than doing all these things. So you have to, again, align your expectations to what, you know, I'm not suggesting that you quit your job and, and you can't put food on the table for the family. I'm just suggesting that there is a way, and if you will find it, you will do it. If your fear is properly allocated into the proper fear, meaning the fear of having that job for 50 years as opposed to having, you know, doing the right thing. That makes sense. And also, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it young when you don't have the responsibilities, you don't have the mortgage, you don't have the kids, you know, probably sure. don't have the spouse. It gets, yeah, it gets harder as you get older because those responsibilities mount. So listeners, now is the time to seize the moment and uh, definitely check out both of MJ's books, which will be linked to prominently in the show notes over at graduatejobpodcast.com slash fastlane. And speaking of books, MJ, now, your top tips for listeners, what book would you recommend that they read? What's had a big impact on you? Well, I, I started doing this. I recommend the book, the, the book that's going to get you over the next obstacle. That's the book you should be reading. It's like uh, if you have a problem in front of you, okay, well, that's the book you should read, the book, the book that's going to solve that problem. If you have an equation, one plus one equals, and you don't know the answer, you should read a math book. Does that make sense? Yep, no, it makes complete sense. And because, no matter, because, so I was just going to say, MJ, no matter what problem you've got, someone's written a book about how to get over it. Correct, and that's the book you should read because a lot of entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs actually, they take action and they think reading books is action. It's not. So, yeah, reading books is great, but I recommend reading the books that are going to solve problems that, that is in front of you right now. That's a good answer. I uh, I like that one. And uh, thinking then on to websites, is there one website you'd recommend people should uh, go and check out? Well, of course, the fastlaneforum.com. Uh, that's my forum. There's uh, over 20,000 entrepreneurs there. Uh, I am there every single day contributing and helping. There's uh, multiple millionaire entrepreneurs there who are there to help other people find their way. Um, and, you know, a good, a good portion of them are aspiring entrepreneurs still navigating their way into the business world so um it's perfectly free uh and again i'm there every day helping people out brilliant so listeners make sure you're not where you used to be browsing the internet checking the daily mail sidebar of shame you know do that <laughs> and uh link to the fast lane for fast lane forum where you can uh, get inspired instead and final question mj normally i ask uh, my guest what uh, one tip they have uh, to help people get the job of their dreams, but we'll tweak it today. What one tip would you give people to help them to start their own business? Provide value. If you provide value, the market will gravitate to you and give you money. And if they give you money, you can have financial freedom. You can have time freedom. You can have all the freedom you want in the world if you provide value because the market people gravitate to value that's a brilliant point for us to end on mj thank you so much for appearing on the graduate job podcast what's the best way for people to get in touch with you and the work that you do uh, i'm all over the place uh, the fastlaneforum.com again i'm there every day twitter mj demarco uh instagram uh facebook we name it i'm pretty easy to find <laughs> Perfect. MJ, thank you so much for appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast. Thanks, James. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Listeners, wow. There you go. MJ DeMarco for you. I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. Many thanks again to MJ. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. I first read his book now back in 2014, and I've been wanting to get him on the show ever since. I highly, highly recommend that you get yourself a copy of his books buy them through the Amazon links in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash fastlane and help to support the show. Now this episode might be one that you want to listen to again so digest it, 
let the messages sink in and then when you do you probably realize that trading time for money isn't the best equation and it's probably not going to give you the life you want to lead when you come to retire in however many years time once that realization has sunk in then you can begin to make changes accordingly as Zig Ziglar apparently said the first step in solving a problem is to recognize that it does exist so read MJ's books and get yourself moving from the sidewalk to the fast lane and also getting yourself unscripted in the process so there you go people that brings us to the end of episode 64 it's been a pretty busy summer with weddings and trips and things and everything else so i've not been as prolific with the old podcast department as i would have liked to have been but don't you worry i've got some cracking episodes coming up with some great guests and i promise to get them back on track and make them more regular make sure you do drop me a note and say hello with my cunning email address at hello at graduatejobpodcast.com I do enjoy it when people drop me a line and let me know what they're getting up to and the troubles they might be having with uh, different aspects of the recruitment process. It always gives me lots of ideas for shows that you would like to see. And if you did like the show, then please leave me a review on iTunes, just like Sophie did this week when she said, loving the show, it's given me a boost and ideas for companies I want to apply to. Thanks Sophie for taking the time to leave a review. Listeners, it is very easy to do, so you've made it this far through the episode today, so the least you can do is leave me a review on iTunes or wherever you download these podcasts from. Do join me next week when I will explore how to pivot your career after university. It's a goodie. Well, it will be when I finish recording it. All that's left to say, though, is I hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next week.